despite the many benefits we get from nature I just mentioned, um, our modern lifestyles have created a disconnect from the natural environment. Some researchers estimate that humans spend about 90% of their lives indoors. That's frightening. Not only are we missing out on the beneficial effects of nature, but as a result, we're less connected and feel less responsibility to protect the environment. Building connections to water, wildlife, and wild places is in fact the mission and vision of the South Carolina Aquarium. We understand very well that connection is critical to protection. The South Carolina Aquarium is located in the heart of Charleston, right on the Charleston Harbor. It's an absolutely gorgeous building, as you can see. But the real beauty is that we are a regional aquarium showcasing the regions of South Carolina's South Carolina from the mountains to the sea. It's really, really cool that the planners who designed this building understood that we didn't need to look beyond our state to build an exciting place for our guests to visit and learn. I'll talk a little bit more about those regions in my next slide. I think it's important now to note that modern zoos and aquariums play an essential role in conservation because we're uniquely positioned to create deep and personal connections between people and nature. So a little bit about South Carolina. South Carolina is located on the southeastern seaboard of the US here in red um, and is called the Palmetto State because of its large population of palmetto trees. It's a small state in size, but very rich in history and culture and has an amazing array of biodiversity. That biodiversity likely stems from the six different land form, land form regions of South Carolina. Starting with um, the upper top corner, the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains um, are, are a small percentage of the state. Then we have the Piedmont, the Sand Hills, Intercoastal Plain, Outer Coastal Plain, and the Coastal Zone. I'll just go into a little more depth about those landforms. The Blue Ridge Mountains take up about 2% of Carol uh, South Carolina's landmass, but account for much of its biodiversity. Uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains are part of the Appala Appalachian Mountains, which is the oldest mountain range in the US. A lot of our streams in South Carolina actually begin from this, uh, these mountains. The Piedmont is the largest region of South Carolina. Piedmont literally means foot of the mountains, so these are the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. The sand hills are covered with leftover sand dunes from when South Carolina's coastline was here uh, millions of years ago. Pretty amazing. The fall line is a geographic feature that separates the Piedmont from the coastal plain and I'm sorry, the Piedmont from the sand hills and is a, an area that uh, elevation drops and a lot of the rivers form rapids right at that fall line. It's really, really cool. Um, the sandy soil of the sand hills is not growing, uh, is not good for growing crops, so this region is dominated by uh, pine woodland. The inner coastal plain has excellent soil for farming and is considered the agricultural heart of South Carolina. Uh, crops include, include wheat, uh, soybean, cotton, peanuts. I have spent many, many years with um, my daughter playing soccer and traveling to the Midlands uh, for soccer games. And it always is, it, it, it's always new and exciting, even though I've driven it many times, just to see uh, the agriculture uh, in the Midlands. It, it's, uh, I, I stop and take pictures every single time. It's, it's really funny. Um, the inner coastal plain, I'm sorry, the outer coastal plain is flat land that includes forests. Um, often these forests are wetlands and swamps like this cypress swamp that you see here um, in Cypress Gardens. And then of course the coastal zone borders the Atlantic Ocean and includes marshes, sandy beaches, sand dunes, and barrier islands. South Carolina is well known for its rivers and lakes that span throughout the entire state. These are also known as surface waters. The map here shows the primary rivers, but there are thousands of streams and creeks that branch off from these rivers. Our surface waters are flowing typically from the northwest to the southeast, 
of the state, with all of them eventually draining into the Atlantic Ocean. Rivers are considered the lifeblood of landscape and are a critical source of fresh water. In fact, 50% of South Carolina's drinking water comes from surface waters. The other 50% is groundwater. So these rivers in South Carolina connect us. They connect our communities, they connect our people, our love of nature, our hobbies and, and sports. Um, and that's the theme for my presentation today, connection. And for reference, um, the, South Carolina, the South Carolina Aquarium is located in Charleston where I just put this star. So how do we at the aquarium build connections? Well, we do it in a variety of ways, certainly as an attraction where over 400,000 people visit annually to enjoy themselves and experience the natural world, but also as an educator in our on-site classrooms like the one you see here and in classrooms in all 46 counties across South Carolina. We have a traveling uh, uh, school program uh, that is, is extremely busy almost every school day of the year. It's incredible. We've also been able to reach students of all ages and all backgrounds through distance learning. Our programs have been live streamed into classrooms across five different continents, sometimes reaching as many as 15,000 students at a time. In these photographs, you see a, a digital field trip that was enjoyed by a third grade class in Istanbul. We also help build these important connections through our Sea Turtle Care Center, a program that's designed to treat threatened and endangered sea turtles that wash up along the coast, most often injured from human impacts. We provide top-notch care, medical care, and uh, animal care to give these animals their best chances of survival. Every guest that walks through our doors can meet the patients, they can watch our team care for them, and have an interactive experience with the surrounding exhibitry. It's really, really hands-on and um, experiential. And our goal ultimately is to release robust, healthy sea turtles back into the ocean to rejoin populations with the hopes of increasing those populations. We go to these great lengths because these species have been around for millions of years and serve as sentinels for the ocean's health. These events draw big crowds, and even when we have private releases, uh, virtual streaming allows us to bring this to thousands of homes and, 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 uh, and thousands of people. So uh, this is a great way to connect people to these ancient mariners. And again, that connection is, is so important. So sea turtle rehabilitation uh, is just one piece of the big puzzle for sea turtle conservation. Sea turtle conservation in South Carolina is conducted by thousands of community members uh, and includes nest protection, education, um, outreach, in water research, fisheries regulations, stranding and salvage, uh, and an entire network that spans the coast, and lab research. And the great news is that because of these efforts from this incredibly dedicated community, sea turtle populations are showing signs of recovery. You guys working together, we didn't know we would see this recovery actually happening, but we are experiencing this recovery and it's pretty amazing. However, in our sea turtle care center, we've seen firsthand an increase in patients coming in with plastics in their GI tracts. 40 turtles in 22 years, 35 of those 40 in the last seven years. Unfortunately, this is the same trend we're seeing along roadways and waterways with plastic pollution. And we know it's not just a threat to sea turtles, but to all marine life from plankton to whales and ultimately to our own health. So the aquarium developed a conservation department in 2015 to begin working beyond our walls to mitigate things like plastic pollution, sea level rise, and work on uh, sustainable seafood. And, uh, in terms of plastics, which is my, the main crux of my, my presentation today, um, one of our first significant investments was Breaking Down Plastic, a one-day global summit that was entirely solutions-based. We had some of the best minds in this space gathered in Charleston for the event. Um, and uh, Adrian Grenier kicked off the event. He's a well-known actor and environmentalist. It was really mind-blowing um, and, and, and amazing to be part of it to listen to the solutions that are out there far beyond what I could imagine. 
it was at that summit that we kicked off the very first citizen science project uh, that we created aimed at mitigating plastic pollution called the litter free digital journal. Uh, this was created in partnership with the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. And we have since built out uh, seven citizen science projects, as you see here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so when we launched Litter Free Digital Journal, uh, there, there, were, there was no litter tracker that had an open source data platform. And that was really critical for us. We want communities to not only be able to collect this important environmental data, but to be able to access the data and use it on their own to find solutions that work for their communities. This is a map that you can go to in the litter free digital journal and um, all of the hexagons here represent hundreds, thousands really uh, of litter observations. Well, when we first did this, we uh, began working along the coast mainly with sea turtle nest protection teams who are out on the beaches already picking up litter already and already have this concern for sea turtles right we began to work with them to capture litter data but it didn't take long to understand that we had to expand our work throughout the state because of that connection the connection that we have of our waterways uh this intricate web of waterways a plastic bag in Greenville or in Columbia could easily make its way into the coast and I'm sure does make make its way to the coast uh, within days. And so we can't we can't fix or mitigate uh, the pollution along the coast and unless we are working inland to do the same thing. So our conservation team builds connections beyond our walls in communities across the state with hands-on litter sweeps with data collection. Um, if we didn't have masks on in this picture, you would see 30 smiling faces. This was a sweep in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and there was such incredible energy and camaraderie and just the feeling that we're, we're working together to do something good uh, and healthy for the environment and ultimately for us. We connect with people from all ages and all backgrounds uh, and religions. It's it's just phenomenal. And when when you're out cleaning up the environment, you it doesn't matter who what, what religion people are or where they came from. Um, we're just we're all in this together, and it's really um, just an incredible feeling. Here, just some more uh, photographs, and I have thousands and thousands of these. So, you know, this is just a, a small smattering of, of our programs, but beaches, waterways, uh, roadways, parks, marshes, and rivers, thousands of South Carolinians have participated in, in this effort, and their eyes are open to the issues. And the best part is that they feel like a million bucks when they leave these events. They're connected not only with nature, but with each other. And that's something we all crave, even if we don't know it. So with this statewide reach, we've begun to see trends uh, that we see along the coast, lots and lots of litter, mostly single use plastic. These photographs were taken from waterfront sites in four different counties in the Midlands and in the upstate. Um, this is pretty eye opening and it means lots of data has been gathered uh, that can be used for change. And that change has um, come from businesses, as well as 19 single use plastic bans in South Carolina, many of which uh, data was used to help inform. Uh, data was also helped uh, stave off a statewide ban on plastic bans that the plastic industry was trying to um, uh, move through the state house, um, and it was critical in passing two smoking bans on South Carolina beaches. And one of the coolest parts is to see people of all ages making their voices heard in front of these local leaders. By celebrating conservation successes, we ignite hope and inspire the next generation. And I'd like to just make a plug at this point, anyone can use a litter free digital journal, no matter where you are in the US or across the globe. So where do we go from here? How do we create a paradigm shift? That means convincing folks that don't consider themselves conservationists to take part in conservation. We have to connect people to the natural world. That's a critical aspect of this. Spreading the word on the science of blue mind, the state of peace associated with being in near or around water. We have to engage diverse communities in the efforts. Um, this often means meeting them where they are. 
we have to celebrate successes to give a sense of hope and confidence that we can do this. Putting pressure on elected leaders is important to protect their communities and their community members. But finally, hope. Hope is working together. We can be hopeful for the future, and especially if we bring science to bear. We have it within us. You have it within you. We're in this effort with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, so next, um, uh, we have Rachel Hawes, the Land, Water, and Wildlife Program Manager for the Coastal Conservation League. Uh, Rachel specializes in both local and regional scale restoration of marine and coastal ecosystems like oyster reefs and salt marshes. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Gray. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So I don't think it's a surprise or, or would be a surprise for anyone who is attending this or anyone on the panel that uh, water management is gonna be a major, major challenge for us in the near future. Yeah, you know, I think everyone, especially if you live on the coast in any state, almost on the East Coast for that matter, um, is seeing the effects of increased water, whether that is coming from the ocean side, from the sky. I think, you know, we're all experiencing this question of what to do with with this water and, and what the impacts are to our to our coastal communities. So there, there are two schools of thought on how to deal with that water. There's the more common one that we see a lot that are um, hard infrastructure called gray infrastructure. So those are those are seawalls, those are groins, those are jetties, those are these impermeable static uh, barriers. But then there's this other really compelling uh, set of green infrastructure that you work with. Uh, what, what are some of the, the big um, elements of that and what are some of the benefits of working with green infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, to back up a little bit too, I think under having an understanding of, of maybe why the gray is not always the best option. Um, when you think about our salt marsh and in a lot of our coastal estuary habitat, uh, it is going to be impacted by sea level rise, right? We know our sea levels are rising. Um, so what, what, what does that mean for us? And our salt marsh, you know, we, South Carolina has 350,000 acres of salt marsh. So it's going to have kind of two survival strategies in the face of sea level rise. It either needs to grow up in elevation with the sea level rising so it doesn't drown. Um, which is typically that's that can be done naturally, but also the help of you know humans, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, the other option is for it to migrate backwards and landward, kind of towards higher ground into our coastal corridors. But we know you know coastal development is increasing on the coast, um, and as it increases, we have more developments right there. And with that becomes the need to kind of protect our shoreline from some of the erosion that we're seeing. And, and the gray, grayer infrastructure methods block that salt marsh from nationally migrating and then it ends up drowning. So we lose that precious habitat. So it's really important to kind of think about what else can we do because you know we have to live with nature and we want to live here also. And, and that's there's a way for us to all live on the coast together, but what can we do to ensure that we still have that protection from the estuary habitat? And you're right, that is kind of where we start promoting those greener, people say greener, more natural shoreline solutions, as opposed to some of those hardened gray shoreline solutions. And those can be anything from using anything natural from oyster shells to salt marsh plantings to core logs. There are a lot of different materials out there that are being tested, but essentially they all have the same goal of increasing and supporting that natural habitat that's already there that protects us, those oysters, that salt marsh, kind of the root system of plants um, to continue to use that as our shoreline buffer and protection. How do we enhance that habitat and work with it? 
So we have uh, viewers uh, from around the world today. So they, they may uh, have more experience with mangrove or seagrass or coral reefs or other, other systems that fulfill similar roles to, uh, to what we, uh, we see with our salt marshes. What, what are some of those core ecosystem functions that we benefit from? Yeah, and it's all similar. You know, I think we can look at it from a plant perspective, right? So you're right. Some people have mangroves, some people have other types of plants that border their coastline. Um, but regardless of what you have, it's that root system that holds those plants into the ground. And that kind of stabilizes our shoreline and keeps that sediment in place while also buffering a lot of the energy impacts that our shorelines face that cause erosion. So that can be from just your average boat wake or, or current, or it can be from storms and storm surge and hurricanes. You know, it's known that our wetlands and our mangroves protect our coast um, with millions of dollars in protective value. So I think there's a benefit to using those more natural options because you know, it's, it's, they're meant to live there and they have less maintenance requirements. Um, but they're really stabilizing that shoreline. All of them are doing the same thing by stabilizing that shoreline with that root system, um, as well as providing a host of ecosystem um, benefits and services. And th that's such a great point about um, the massive amount of, of infrastructure that they protect and how they are these, these incredibly engineered um, uh, um, kind of elements that we don't have to figure out how to create new ones. They already work so well. Um, and one of the things that I find most compelling about your work is you're working with uh, often ordinary citizens along their coast who are embracing these uh, systems to protect their homes, protect their communities. Uh, what, what do some of those programs look like? Yeah, I think what's amazing about, about it, and, and again, throughout the whole country on the coast, there are so many great organizations that are more community-based organizations and community-led organizations. And those have a real benefit to our to our coastal towns. And I think it gets people out outside in the environment, helping out with these different types of restoration projects. You know, one in particular, at least in our area in South Carolina is with the Department of Natural Resources SCORE program, the South Carolina Oyster Restoration and Enhancement Program. And they are a community-based volunteer program that helps put out and restore our oyster reefs and our salt marsh along the coast through community-based volunteers. And, and that's a great effort. You know, um, we also have a few other really notable organizations that are also doing community-based restoration, like Seeds to Shoreline through Sea Grant. Um, and there are a few others that I encourage everyone to check out because it's a great way to kind of get outside and also have a hands-on learning experience um, while doing it. So uh, what, what is one of these um, oyster reef builds like for someone who's never gone on one before? So like I said, the DNR SCORE program does a lot of these community-based events and they will prep all of the material for you. Um, you can also participate throughout the year in that prep. And that looks like, depending on what the material is, they either bag um, recycled oyster shell, or they've created these wire cages that also hold the oyster shell. Um, all of them have different purposes and functions and can be used in different types of shoreline habitat. So they all have their purpose, but when you have that, you show up and the volunteers give you a whole host of information and education about why this habitat is so important and take you out to the site that they've selected and you're in the salt marsh and you're in the pluff mud and you are essentially putting out these different types of materials onto our intertidal zone because South Carolina has intertidal oysters. And essentially what they're doing is creating substrate in our habitat uh, for our baby oysters to attach to. So the way South Carolina's oysters work 
is that we are through research, it is thought that we are substrate limited, meaning we don't have enough substrate out there for our oysters to settle on. Uh, that's why you see oftentimes oysters on dock pilings and rocks and attaching to anything that's out there. They do prefer a calcium carbonate shell type material. However, they will attach to anything if it's out there. And so if they don't have that substrate to attach to, they end up drowning in the puff mud. So there's a really great benefit of helping put out that extra substrate um, onto our shoreline and attracting those baby oysters to then build a reef from there. So um, these, these issues we're talking about, um, obviously they aren't localized issues, even though they are localized solutions in some cases. Um, how, how does your work apply on a more regional scale? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point um, and something that's really interesting from my perspective is that while we are a local nonprofit organization and we do a lot of local based work, um, you know, we feel the impacts federally from federal funds and federal grants that are out there. I think the the government right now has prioritized in a lot of ways coastal resilience funding and, and restoration funding. And that's been really great to see um, throughout the whole country, you know, uh, prioritizing this coastal restoration resilience fund. So um, the all of the coastal states are having access to increased funds to do this type of work. Um, and with that being said, that also helps promote more regional projects because um, when you have this federal funding that's opened up to the whole region, you can work together with different organizations to help apply for this funding and think about these solutions on a more regional scale. Um, which has its own benefits itself too. You know, you need a little bit of it all, the localized approach, but also the regional broader strategy and approach as well. So let's, let's contextualize that a little bit. So um, before these new federal funds that are about to come in, um, uh, what, what kind of scale were local organizations working with and what kinds of impacts uh, are, are these new federal dollars going to make in their efforts? You know, I think this funding is always competitive. So uh, I'll start with saying that, that while there is an increase in the funding, it is still difficult to apply for and it is still competitive. Um, but the more you have, the more you can do. So I will say that um, because of that, you know, that means we have more opportunities to apply for the funding in our area. And um, that has increased the productivity of some product of some projects and um, opened up some more resources to a lot of our organizations in the area that could use more staff um, to do some of this work. What impacts do you think uh, ordinary citizens will start seeing uh, as these, these reefs, as these salt marshes are restored uh, surrounding their communities? I, I think, you know, our estuary habitat where, where our salt marsh and oysters are, um, play a huge role in our state's economy and our in, in what we think of when we think of, you know, Kelly said this a couple of times and what we think of when we think of our coast, it is our home, it is ingrained in why people live here and why people want to be here and are passionate about it. Um, and that that speaks in the dollars too, right? So I, I think there's a stat that's our coastal tourism contributes $9 billion to our state and over 100,000 jobs. And then, you know, then you think about our fisheries and, and similarly, that is millions and millions of dollars that our fisheries support our economy and jobs. And so there's a huge impact to restoring and protecting this habitat, not just for the coastal protection aspect, but for all of us who like to go fishing, recreating, birding, um, who like clean water, you know, I mean, I think it, it plays a huge role in our everyday, whether you are a quote unquote environmentalist who likes to go out in the water or you just simply enjoy our habitat and live here um, just as an aesthetic and view shed. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. I, I really appreciate that. And that is the perfect segue to our next panelist. Uh, Steve Durkee is a fishery management um, specialist with a focus in highly migratory species management, and he works in support of NOAA fisheries. Steve, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. 
Yeah, thanks for having me. What a, what a great event, Dre. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so let's let's go right off of uh, Rachel's answer there. We, we see how um, these direct impacts of restoring um, these core natural systems, these nurseries of, of our fisheries can, can play a significant role in, uh, in, in the management of, of those. Uh, how, how are you seeing um, the, the state of, of our fisheries as these areas are being restored? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hit and miss in different places. Um, you know, restoring different habitat to support fisheries is super important because you know, fisheries has a big role um, in, in how we use the ocean. Um, of all the ways that humans actually impact the ocean, uh, fisheries is probably one of the biggest, second to probably only climate change uh, at, at this point. So, you know, how, how do we do that? What does that mean? Well, I kind of feel like there's, there's different dimensions to, to fisheries. You know, there's, there's social dimensions, there's economic dimensions, and there's conservation dimensions. And so that conservation dimensions really get to kind of what Rachel was talking about, really kind of supporting not just, you know, reducing the number of fish that we're catching, but also increasing recruitment into that population. If we're using some of those marsh areas as nursery grounds for some of these fish, bringing more fish into that population just provides a lot of benefits for anyone actually using that resource. So you brought up a really interesting distinction there. So we have our, our recreational use and we have our commercial use. Uh, what, what does that look like, at least in our region? And um, how, how are those impacts uh, measured and understood? Well, it's interesting. So, you know, recreational commercial fisheries, in the end, kind of have really similar goals. You know, their goal is to go out there and catch a certain species they're looking for. Um, how that works, sometimes those in conflict. Um, sometimes the species that a recreational fisherman is trying to catch is the same as a commercial fisherman, and there could be some, some competition. Other times it's different species, but perhaps they interact with those species, so there could be some, some interplay in that. Specifically for South Carolina, looking at the difference between recreational and commercial fishermen uh, is, is an important distinction. You know, South Carolina has a really robust, strong commercial fisheries uh, system, but we're not one of the top producers in the country. You know, places like New England or out in Alaska that's got, you know, uh, you know, big ground fish stocks just have so much more value in landings than South Carolina. So when you look at it from a commercial fisheries landings perspective, South Carolina is not very high on the list, despite how important it is locally to this region and to this state. But then from a recreational perspective, though, we're one of the top. Um, there's some areas, you know, in Florida and perhaps California, New York, New Jersey might have some, some more recreational fishing efforts. But as far as total number of trips uh, in the whole U.S., South Carolina ranks number five in the total number of trips. We've got a lot of people going out there and using this resource, not necessarily extracting you know, fish. They can also be doing catch and release, but this is the way they're choosing to spend some time and get out and uh, enjoy the ocean environment. So you, uh, you said that um, recreational and commercial use and, and often commercial to commercial or recreational or to recreational can uh, come in conflict. Um, uh, what, what are some of the species that we're talking about in particular with, uh, with these prime fisheries targets and how can impacting one species impact the others? Great question. So um, in South Carolina specifically, the, the major uh, fish species for commercial fishermen are things like blue crab, um, shrimp, obviously. Uh, surprisingly, swordfish is a huge uh, industry here as well, you know, landing swordfish. And uh, all of those species aren't typically too, too important for recreational fishermen. There are some recreational fisheries for those as well, of course. Recreational fishermen, we see targeting things more like uh, kingfish and croaker and bluefish, red drum, et cetera. Um, it kind of depends really what you're thinking about as far as what a fisherman, mean, a recreational fisherman intends to catch and release versus catch and keep. Um, I think probably the, the number one, at least by weight, species in South Carolina fishermen keep is mullet. And that's probably just for bait. They're not catching or releasing those very much. But from a catch and release perspective, they're catching tons of flounder and kingfish and croaker and, and catching those and then just taking a picture perhaps and releasing those off. So this can kind of have some interplay as well. So if a, um, if a commercial fisherman's out there uh, catching shrimp with a large trawl net, um, it's possibly going to interact with some of those species that a recreational fishermen's interested in. You know, perhaps those croakers or other fish that are out there in that kind of near shore marine environments. So there could be some conflict there. Um, if a fisherman wants to have a recreational fisherman wants to have those robust fish stocks, they could be concerned that the commercial fishermen's causing too much um, 
negative impact on that. So how do we kind of uh, marry those two interests? And I think that that's where strong fisheries management comes in. That's where really strong, robust science and good data sets are important. Understanding, you know, what is the impact of a shrimp trawl on certain species? And are there some in engineering solutions we can put into place uh, to, to stop that? Uh, maybe circling back with Kelly a little bit on, on sea turtles. You know, uh, shrimp trawls can have a big impact on sea turtles. Not that sea turtles are a recreational fishing species, but another kind of, you know, species they interact with. And, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, we put bycatch reduction devices into these shrimp trawl nets. And we're seeing what a game changer that was. I mean, we're seeing record years of sea turtle nesting, probably largely because some of these engineering solutions in commercial fisheries, that the basis of which was just good data, good information and good engineering. So uh, kind of following along with that, the good management, the good data, um, uh, a lot of that's going to be impacted by things that both Rachel and uh, Kelly were talking about. They, they are the impacts of sea level rise and uh, the changing chemistry of the ocean in some cases, and then um, our inputs into it, whether that's plastic pollution or other forms of it. Um, how are you seeing the uh, the core species that are either the supporters of the, the core fishery targets or, uh, or the specific fishery targets being impacted by uh, all of these different factors that we're throwing at them. Sure. You know, I think all of those factors are super important and they all have uh, a place in it, but it really seems like climate change is really the biggest thing that's, that's driving a lot of this, especially for fish that move and um, locate around different ocean temperatures or ocean currents or other, you know, ocean conditions. So uh, like any kind of climate change discussion, I mean, there's, there's winners and losers with that as that environment changes. You know, for example, um, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, oysters are super important and oysters are in big trouble. I'm thinking of places like uh, Apalachicola, you know, that was the center of the oyster fishery and that's closed, completely closed because of uh, perhaps some saltwater intrusion uh, impacts and just the way that the inland states are using water um, uh, uh, upriver a little bit. So that could be good for South Carolina. We've got a really robust oyster fishery, perhaps that's good. Um, other negative ways perhaps though, yeah, are shrimp. Um, you know, I'm from Virginia Beach originally, and I'm starting to learn now some of these shrimp trawlers are going as high as Virginia Beach and catching shrimp, which is, which is mind boggling. So maybe some of these, you know, really robust shrimp fisheries we have here might be slowly migrating north. And those are, those are some, some, some commercial examples. Recreationally, I'm sure we've all heard uh, plenty of people who have fished in South Carolina for, you know, 20, 30 years talk about the robust yellowfin tuna fishery here. And in the past 10 years, they're, they're just not here. And there seems to be some indication that there's some, some open ocean problems happening with some other countries and fisheries, but largely those yellowfin tuna just could be up off North Carolina at this point. As they move towards the pole with those shifts in ocean temperatures, they just leave this areas where they were historically located and they're going somewhere else. That could be good for North Carolina, but uh, it definitely doesn't make South Carolina anglers very happy. So that's, that's a great point. Just like with uh, marsh management and these ecological uh, projects that Rachel was working on, when it comes to fishery management, this isn't just something that is a local issue. It is one that's it's regional or beyond. Uh, what's a way that, that local people can get involved to make sure that uh, they are making a positive impact on, on the fish populations, on the, the life that is on our coastal and offshore uh, communities? Absolutely. So fisheries is super complex and trying to expect someone uh, at a grocery store counter or in a restaurant trying to decide between two or three fish, it's really complicated. You know, there's pluses and minuses with anything. Um, I think generally, you know, especially in my role supporting NOAA fisheries, I'll, I'll admit my bias right now with, you know, federal fisheries management, but we do a pretty good job in the U.S. If you've got a U.S. caught fish, it's probably caught sustainably. It probably has some bycatch production uh, protections in place. And you can feel pretty good about that. So Perhaps one way that a, a consumer could go uh, to a fish market or grocery store or restaurant is to choose a, uh, a U.S. wild caught fish. Narrowing that down a little bit to South Carolina, though, let's get something locally. Uh, there's a couple of different benefits to that. One, of course, is, you know, just carbon pollution, having a locally sourced fish just that uh, didn't travel as far. That's got some carbon um, some benefits to it. But then also we have such a robust program in the U.S. and locally to make sure that we're not overfishing certain stocks and we're also trying to avoid bycatch. If you're getting that same species of fish from a different country, that's an open question mark. Um, I feel pretty confident in saying that we are one of the global leaders in the US and locally in sustainable fisheries. So if you eat a swordfish that was landed here in South Carolina, 
that swordfish was probably caught with a circle hook to prevent sea turtle interactions. They couldn't use, you know, live baits to make sure other bycatch species weren't there. They have cameras on their vessels. They have, you know, reporting requirements, et cetera. If you're catching one from overseas, perhaps, um, uh, you know, South America or Europe or even, you know, closer partners like Canada, they don't have those same protections in place. So the environmental impact from that single swordfish fillet you're eating is higher if it's an imported fish versus a locally um, sourced fish. So kind of going back to um, the, the imagery of us being at our grocery counter, looking, looking for some uh, like a beautiful cut of uh, a fish or fillet of fish for, for dinner. Um, we, we kind of are running into the same problem that we do with a lot of agriculture in general and a lot of food production in general, where we have a vague idea of where that food comes from and how the process of creating that food works. But most of us really don't have, have a way of understanding clearly where this, this comes from. You just gave a great example of the circle hooks for the swordfish. Uh, what, what kind of system um, do, these, do these locally caught fish come from? And how does that contrast with the larger industrial processes that we're seeing um, uh, other outsourced shrimp or other outsourced staples like that uh, coming from? Sure. Um, so uh, really the way, to, the way to think about it is that uh, an industrial style fishery doesn't necessarily mean bad. It can mean bad because the, the potential impact that they have is, um, is huge. There's a lot of hooks in the water, a lot of effort. They need to have tight controls. Um, local smaller artisanal fisheries, maybe not as much. So uh, there are some differences there as well. If you've got a single hook in the water, the chance of you individually having a huge impact um, isn't as high. That said though, let's look at you know, recreational fisheries versus commercial fisheries. Recreational fishermen, a single recreational fisherman, the, the possibility of them having the same environmental impact as a larger you know, uh, fishing vessel is, is, is really small. Um, it's just you know, a few hooks, a little bit of effort, no big deal. But if you've got just a small handful of commercial vessels and then millions of recreational vessels, that compounds into a pretty large impact back and forth. So to some extent, a single or small number of handful of vessels, you can regulate much more closely. And I think that's kind of where um, uh, minimizing your impact comes into. You need a really robust regulatory system that allows for strong science, strong data to inform these management solutions that minimize the negative environmental impacts. Um, and, and, and that way you can be a little bit more trusting of what you're actually consuming and not need to jump into the details and know that there's a circle hook attached with it. You can simply say, I'm feeling confident about the management process behind this fish stock. I don't need to know the details. I know I can get it. The same way that you might choose uh, perhaps a Volvo car. You might not know exactly the safety features or the algorithm they use to identify, you know, um, roadside hazards up front with their camera systems, but you have some trust into that, into that uh, manufacturer that they've got protections into place. And that could be enough um, uh, to give some confidence. And part of management uh, also involves closing either entire or parts of, of fisheries at times when necessary. And we've seen that achieved through no catch zones or marine protected areas. Uh, we haven't seen as much of that on our East Coast yet as, as in some other parts of the world, but, but we are able to be successful as you're saying through other management means. Um, what roles could marine protected areas play uh, on the commercial side versus the recreational side? And how could they create some benefits uh, and some unintended con consequences in other ways? Yeah, I mean, it's a hot topic right now. Um, the Biden administration recently put out the America the Beautiful executive order and uh, also known by the 30 by 30. Um, act, you know, protecting 30% of terrestrial and aquatic environments by 2030. So, you know, working with the administration and trying to figure out what this means and how they conserve areas is a really timely topic. Um, and it actually kind of might bleed into the governance, you know, discussion later as well, because, you know, having some marine protected areas where you can't fish is, is one way of achieving that. But also if you have an offshore wind area, or perhaps you have an ocean mining area or in the Gulf of Mexico oil and gas, those can become de facto you know, marine protected areas, even though there could be some extraction happening there as well. So I think that one reason you don't always see large wholesale closures on the East Coast beyond things like you know, monuments uh, up in the Northeast, et cetera, is that we're pretty good about targeting uh, fishery management rules uh, based on what the impact is. So 
if, if a certain area has a very sensitive bottom coral habitat that we need to protect, we can target regulations to protect that bottom coral habitat and maybe just allow some surface trolling or some surface um, uh, fishing. Uh, on, the, on the other side of that, perhaps the, the bottom is so deep, we're not worried about you know, deep water impacts. It is more of a surface problem. Well, then we can, we can put regulations into place to, to protect those more surface species. If it's a complex environment where there's a lot of factors coming uh, together at once, perhaps we need to close it to all fishing. And that's things they're looking at right now through uh, possible closures like in Hudson Canyon, et cetera, that are out for, for, uh, for public comment right now. So I, I should go ahead and say, at least on, on our side, that um, uh, Sustainable Ocean Alliance is currently uh, supporting a moratorium on seabed mining, uh, at least until we can gather uh, sufficient uh, information and, and fully map the seafloor to understand its impacts. Um, so just continuing on here, we're, we were talking about kind of all of these, these commercial and economic impacts, but kind of scaling back to the communities themselves, uh, what role do fisheries play in, in these coastal communities like those in, in coastal South Carolina? Absolutely. So kind of coming back a little bit to that, that first idea, these different dimensions of, of fisheries, you've got social, economic, and conservation. We've talked conservation a lot. Um, economics are there, of course, as, as well. It's, it's not too complicated to think about, you know, these, these provide some monetary value to it. But now you're kind of going into the social part a little bit. And this is super important. Uh, there's a lot of people whose identity is wrapped up in fishing. Um, there are places whose identity is wrapped up in fishing. Let's look at Cape Cod in Massachusetts. It's literally named after a fish. So, you know, fishing and the fishing life and the fishing lifestyle, um, it can become part of your identity. And protecting that is super important. Um, it's a way of getting people outside, enjoying the ocean environment, caring about the ocean environments, and also giving them a way to um, uh, uh, enjoy those areas um, as needed. So how do we protect that? Well, I think we, what we need to do is make sure that we have a, a system in place where it's accessible to everyone. Um, if you are an inland uh, resident that wants to go out into the ocean and fish, how do we get you out there fishing? Um, can, we, can we create rules and laws that, that don't prevent you and make it overly onerous to get out there um, and, and let you out there and enjoy that, perhaps recreationally? Uh, on the flip side, maybe on the commercial side, how do we encourage commercial fishermen to go out there and fish and catch these you know, sustainable uh, seafood resources? But then also, how do we bring new entrants into there? How do we create a system where it's, it's, um, it's uh, advantageous and desirable for new entrants to enter that fishery and go out there? And that really does support that robust social dimension of, of, of fisheries. And so just to, to kind of wrap up here, um, that educational element and that, that element of bringing in uh, innovation and new voices, new ideas into the fisheries is, is equally important. We, our, our fishery here is a graying industry. It is a, an aging industry. Um, what are some of the, the barriers to entry for, for younger participants in that? And what are some ways that young people could enter that field and find ways of innovating within a more sustainable or regenerative uh, form of fishing? Uh, so yes, the, the, the industry is graying. You know, the, you see the average age of fishermen increasing and increasing and increasing and not a lot of new interest in there. And so why is that? Well, one, fishing is tough. It's hard. It's hard work. So I understand the hesitancy to, to jump into it. So other things, though, that maybe we could address besides it being hard work is the regulatory environment. It's really, really complicated. It's my full time job. And when a fisherman calls me to get an answer on what a regulation is, even I'm looking it up. But that's just kind of a result of us having such a robust management structure in place to allow these fisheries to occur with strong bycatch protections. They're just super complicated. So how can we get that information to a new entrant to come in? We've also done a lot of work to reduce effort in some of these fisheries. We saw, especially you know, 15, 20 years ago, a lot, there's a lot of overcapacity in a lot of fisheries. There was too many fishermen chasing too few fish. And we presented some, some ideas and implemented them to reduce efforts and some limited access programs. So now all of a sudden it's really expensive to get in. I mean, we see permits sometimes that cost you know, thousands of dollars or millions of dollars on the private market to actually enter a fishery. So how do we facilitate that? Are there loans? Is there some kind of a way that we can bring people into there? And then finally, maybe just make it more, uh, increase the, the uh, financial incentives. Right now, uh, imports definitely um, decrease the desire to do locally sourced seafood. Taking back to swordfish for an example, just a species I know well, you know, for a U.S. fisherman to catch that swordfish, they need to get maybe five or six dollars a pound to make it worthwhile. But we have imports coming in at 
four dollars a pound. So it's it's hard to, to compete with that. So how do we? And this is this is the same across agriculture or manufacturing. This isn't a unique fisheries problem. But the way that agriculture or manufacturing has found their way around it is to create a, a unique uh, product that has some advantage over an import. So how can we help these local fishermen market their product, their, their fresh products, perhaps direct to, direct to consumer sales, something to make sure that, that product is differentiated from those imports. So it's not just a price discussion. Those are ways we could probably help new entrants into the fishery. Steve, thank you so much. And I think that's such a great point of uh, how can we make our local sustainable fisheries uh, more attractive and more profitable for people to be a part of. That's, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we are joined by Grace Gasper, the Executive Director of Friends of Coastal South Carolina. Uh, Grace is an avian research biologist and nonprofit specialist currently leading the Friends of Coastal South Carolina, a nonprofit dedicated to instilling a conservation ethic in students and encouraging the next generation of scientists through environmental education programs. Grace, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful discussion to listen to so far. Well, wonderful. Um, I, I am going to share a quote from uh, someone who, who's been an inspiration of, of mine with you, uh, Sylvia Earle, the oceanographer. Uh, she tells us that um, knowing is the key to caring and with caring, there's hope that people will be motivated to take positive actions. They may not care even if they know but they can't care if they are unaware. Working in the educational space, in the space of connecting people with uh, um, natural spaces, with uh, protected areas that are, are near their communities, um, what, what is your reaction to that quote? I think it's very true. It's the, you know, Kelly um, alluded to this earlier in her talk, but it's, um, it's the gap in knowledge and the gap in um, seeing our place and our connection in the natural world and understanding what Re, you know, that that sustains us. Um, when we talk about, you know, conservation of our um, water resources and clean air, um, you know, to protect wildlife, but, you know, those are the things that we need too. So when we protect our ecosystems and our environment, um, you know, we protect the things that we need. And I think that knowledge and understanding of how we fit into that is so important. Um, you know, um, it's just, it was inspiring to um, hear Kelly talk about how many um, kids the aquarium is reaching through their um, live stream programs. And um, we reach several thousand kids in person um, each year along the South Carolina coast um, in non COVID times, of course. Um, and that's, you know, really our, is to, our goal is to present that knowledge and to give them, um, you know, the opportunity to embrace it, to understand it, to feel like they're um, part of something bigger. And that, that's so true. That, that is so true. And um, one, of the, one of the parts of, of your work and your organization's work that gets me the most excited is the way that you interact, especially with rural school children to provide them these amazing immersive opportunities. Um, uh, could you could describe some of the programs that uh, y'all are doing and uh, some of the reactions you're seeing among the, the students? Yeah, so um, we partner with three national wildlife refuges along the coast, Cape Romaine, Waccamaw, and Ace Basin, and also the Francis Mary National Forest. And our programs began, you know, 20 years ago on a very small scale, um, reaching the school, rural schools that were in the immediate vicinity of the forest and refuges. Um, in the Ace Basin, we have an elementary school that's literally less than two miles from the front gate of Ace Basin National Wildlife Refuge. And 
a lot of times the community doesn't always see these protected lands as being there for them and they're public lands they're um, for all the American people so for us um, it started out you know not only a, a science learning and environmental stewardship um, opportunity but also a chance to educate kids about the forest and the refuges and let them know that you know those places were there for them and um our programs have grown from there. Um, you know, other schools have asked to join. A teacher moves from one school to another and, and wants to bring the program with her. But, um, you know, a lot of the kids in the more urban areas have a lot of opportunities and the rural schools don't necessarily have so much that's easily accessible. So um, to be able to give them um, an inspiring outdoor experience, a science learning experience was really, you know, sort of where our, our roots are and we grew, you know, to um, reach some of our other schools uh, in more urban areas, you know, as a, as a result of people just learning about the quality of those programs. That, that is such an interesting point that you just made that um, the people who are living on the doorstep of these incredible protected places yeah. often are the ones who are not connected to, to them or they don't, don't feel like it's for yeah. them or there's a sense of ownership for yeah. that. Uh, um, why, why is it so important for everyone, not, not just the, the folks who are regular attendees or regular volunteers for these places, but everyone to feel that sense of ownership for not just our protected places, but for all of our natural spaces? Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the forest and wildlife refuge, you know, on one hand are places, um, you know, the Francis Mary and Cape Romaine are places where South Carolinians have hunted and fished for generations. And that's just sort of a, um, a rite of, of passage in South Carolina. We're just um, a few, you know, entering into duck hunting season and you can't live in the low country without knowing somebody who's a duck hunter. So they're, you know, just some, amazing partners in conservation, but, you know, and, and they've known and appreciated these places, but I think seeing, um, just seeing what's out there, I mean, the southern end of Cape Romaine is 12 miles from three of South Carolina's four largest cities, um, which is pretty amazing to think about. So it truly, and it's 33,000 acres of class one wilderness. So, um, I think it's really important for people to understand, you know, that the resource that the role of the Fish and Wildlife Service is to protect habitat for threatened and endangered species. But, you know, again, we're, you know, back to the connectivity, we're protecting those places, you know, for us as well, they protect the marshes that protect us from storm surge. Um, the wetlands in the forest are what provide our drinking water, what store, you know, um, millions of gallons of storm water when we have a rain event and, you know, sequester carbon, provide our oxygen. So I think just for people to understand the, um, see these places, know that they're there, they're, you know, for all of the American people. And, um, you know, it's, it goes back to the quote you started with, you know, the part of knowledge and understanding is, um, you know, where, where you have to begin. And I think a lot of people see these places as sort of off limits and just for wildlife, but, um, you know, obviously, the, there has to be a place where the wildlife is first priority or we wouldn't have any wildlife. It's like protecting our fisheries and, um, you know, you were discussing earlier, um, but there's still, you know, plenty of room for people to enjoy these amazing places and um, just realize how important they are to, you know, our survival and our quality of life. You know, when we have these significant rain events, especially in um, Georgetown County, there, you know, I mean, Georgetown County is, is defined literally the borders of the county by the rivers, major river systems. And if it wasn't for the floodplains, you know, that the refuge protects, although there have been bad flooding events, they would have been much, much worse. How do these connections, these, these educational opportunities um, change behavior starting at a young age for the students and potentially how does that impact or ripple out through their community? 
Right. Well, you know, we hope it, it kind of goes to telling, you know, your story and how important that is and giving kids an opportunity to sort of form that story and those impressions at a young age. Um, we have parent chaperones that come along on some of the trips. And I think they're, um, you know, as, as inspired as the kids are sometimes, but I think giving them, you know, that opportunity to make the connection, um, to see what scientists do in the field hands-on and to feel like they're doing that, giving them the chance to collect data, to really see how science works, um, to learn, you know, how biologists, you know, survey large areas. We've got um, a lesson um, where we go to the salt marsh and try to figure out um, using transects, how many fiddler crabs are in the 66,000 acres of Cape Romaine. And, and from that, um, they make an assumption about the health of the ecosystem. And so we learn about those foundational things in the ecosystems and how everything depends on that and how everything falls apart if it's not there. And, you know, giving them a chance to just not only be outside and experience that place um, and, you know, see what they can find and discover, but a chance to, you know, use the tools they're learning in class and see that math and science really is useful in the real world. Um, we hope will inspire them to study more of those things. We had a teacher approach us this year. They have some um, new reading material in uh, nonfiction uh, for fifth graders and it has to do with oceans and landforms. And she's like, can you help us? Because the kids are just, it's nonfiction. They're just not finding it that inspiring. But, you know, when we can take them out to a barrier island or, you know, to a salt marsh and they can see, you know, some of the things they're reading about, um, in person, we hope that it certainly, you know, inspires them to see some meaning in that and want to learn more. And hopefully they take, um, you know, we've been trying um, the last couple of years to do more things to engage um, our students' parents and, and at least, you know, give them the opportunity to know what their kids are doing in the programs. So a big part of this too is it's not just the environmentalism, it's not just the conservation, it's also the opportunity, the equity, the uh, the chance for these young people and their families to create a sustainable or in some cases regenerative incomes working in these communities. Um, yeah. how, how are you able to see that uh, transpire from these programs up to opportunities that these students may have uh, to make an impact? Right. Well, through, you know, there's some interesting um, work going on in the Plannersville area in Georgetown County to try to, I mean, the, the one of the cornerstones to conservation is offering rural communities the opportunity, appropriate economic opportunities. And you know, giving there's so many amazing organizations like the Center for Air's Property Preservation and the Land Trust who have helped um, people in rural communities keep and protect their land um, and use it in a sustainable, you know, benefit from it in a sustainable way. But programs that offer, you know, economic opportunity, whether it's through ecotourism, whether it's through, you know, local um, promoting local businesses. Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge has just acquired um, a property called Hasty Point in Plantersville, which is a former rice plantation. And it's part of the historic rice planters corridor. There's 12 properties. And this is the only one that will have public access because all the others are in private ownership. And so not only the um, ecological value, it, you know, is something we can teach, but we'll be able to teach kids about the history of that property and the contribution of enslaved Africans and their connection to the land um, and how it sustained them through time and how they shaped it. So um, it's, you know, I, I believe firmly that, you know, you can't talk about conservation without talking about social justice because it's, you know, when we harm the environment, it's the people who depend on it the most that are hurt the most. So I think giving um, communities a chance to invest um, in protecting you know, their areas and their, um, 
you know, their um, rural way of life um, is something that's, um, you know, as a whole, um, very important to our organization. And I think the um, forest and refuges, you know, really um, realize that and, you know, do a, a tremendous amount of work with the rural communities to try to benefit and to benefit them with opportunity. Absolutely, yes. And that, that's such a great point, um, too, about um, how can we make sure that these communities are, are benefiting in every, in every possible way uh, through that and that they're not being left behind as a part of this, too, because yeah. it's, not, it's not just the, the natural systems, it's the people who are within those systems, the people who are, are the stewards of those systems. And um, I've seen, at least in my work, that providing tools for people to be able to create uh, the future that they want for their families, for themselves, for their communities can be, uh, can be a powerful thing, can be a powerful way of fueling hope. How have you seen that in your work? Well, I think giving, um, you know, on a, on a very small level, which is where everything big starts, um, giving kids a chance to do hands-on projects, um, whether it's collecting data for a citizen science project or doing, you know, a, a habitat enhancement project on the forest or refuges or at their school, um, pollinators or something to help shorebird conservation. Um, engaging them in something that they can, where they can use the knowledge they've gained to feel like they're making a tangible difference. I think if you start, you know, early on feeling like you're empowered to make a difference and to make change and make something better, I think that we're certainly, we hope that um, continues. So I think on the, on the smallest scale, that's a really important opportunity that we provide. And we work with um, some of the programs that were mentioned earlier. Our kids have par participated in Seeds to Shoreline and Oyster Reef Restoration. And so the kids at Creeks in McClellanville, you know, that were fifth graders five, you know, several years ago can walk down to the marsh and, you know, see the Spartina that they, um, planted and the oyster restoration project that they helped with. And that's so cool. Uh, that's so cool. I'm, I bet that's just an amazing experience for them to see that. Um, it's, so, pl it's fluff mud. You know, you can't go wrong with kids in fluff mud. <laughs> it's a natural fit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we, we have an international audience today and going forward with this video and um, I, I'm sure a lot of them are, are seeing their communities, their work uh, in this conversation and the other conversations today. Uh, what, uh, what advice would you give them in replicating your successes uh, in their communities? Oh, gosh. Well, I would say just... Um... You know, the conversation starts with um, your, you know, the local community having the discussion about what they want and what they need. And I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, with the communities figuring out, I mean, nobody can come into a community and be successful trying to tell them what they want or what they need. Um, you know, the community has to figure out the direction that they want to go. And so I would say starting, you know, with that discussion about, you know, what your needs are, what people in the community want to see happen, um, and then reaching out, you know, to people who have expertise in education education and conservation and developing, you know, partnerships um, are, we, you know, obviously today is a great, uh, we're so blessed in the low country to have so many wonderful conservation partners. That's why we've had so many successes. So I would say, you know, um, talk honestly about the needs and then build, build partnerships. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And that is an yeah. amazing segue into our next conversation. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, we have um, uh, a panel that is, is moderated by Andy Gowder. Um, Andy not only is, is my father, but is an expert attorney uh, in land use, sustainable land use management and 
um, uh, working with local communities to create sustainable futures, whether that's through nonprofits or directly between local government and those groups. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Well, thank you, Gray. And this has been, um, uh, you know, both an educational and an inspiring conversation this morning. And so I want to thank all of the speakers and you for uh, for sharing this with us this morning. And I I want to introduce uh, two uh, friends of mine uh, who are engaged in very important work in the local and community level uh, in um, creating a regenerative future uh, for our community. And that is Kelly Vicario with the Preservation Society of Charleston and Robbie Maynor with the Coastal Conservation League. And um, I'm going to let uh, both of them um, uh, speak um, uh, for a few minutes about their experiences here with uh, local governance. But I'd, I'd like to set it up in this way and say that, um, you know, we in our country have this tradition of self-governance. You know, we don't have a ruler, we, we, we rule ourselves. But in, you know, these modern, in modern days, you know, with gridlock in government and, and tribalism and um, feeling, people feeling like they cannot really individually make a difference, um, people feel somewhat isolated and disconnected from their government and feel like they aren't governing themselves and maybe don't have agency over their, um, over their lives. And so into that, um, we really, I think, are seeing a renewed emphasis on engagement with local communities and with local people and um, involving them in the decisions that most directly affect them. And in fact, there's a there's a you know emerging field called regenerative governance that actually talks about uh, a deliberative decision making process where people are provided um, you know the, the best uh, information that um, would inform their decision making and then providing that to the people who all the people who are directly impacted by any particular decision or issue and provide that information to, to them so that they can make the best factual decision and ethical decision. And so uh, I think that's really, you know, I, I don't, I know that Kelly and Robbie may not call what they do that uh, or maybe not until today, but I think that's what I, I think they are engaged in. And so I'm going to um, call on Kelly first and then Robbie and ask Kelly to share with us a little bit about her experience in engaging local communities uh, in their own self-governance. So Kelly, welcome. Thank you, Andy, for uh, that introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and I wanted to speak to you to two examples this morning about self-governance and um, to Andy, your point of, I wasn't thinking about it as self-governance um, until this panel discussion. And I think even just going into the community meeting, it is what we're talking about is self-governance. And so um, one community that we met with, for example, this week um, really felt that the Preservation Society was um, city staff, was city government. And so for our specific organization, we really wanted to engage that community and extend an educational resource while also teaching them the difference between um, an advocacy organization as a 501c3 and the difference in that in the city staff position. Um, because one of the questions that derived from that conversation was what rights do I have as a member? Um, and so we even explained what a PSC membership um, would entail, what, what quote unquote rights they would have. And ultimately as an advocacy organization, we want to serve and represent the community as an advocate um, in public meetings, whether it's the planning commission, whether it's BAR, uh, BZA, whatever public meeting we would be attending. And so with that um, community, we also were reached out to very specifically um, with the question of who are we? What do we do? What does it mean when we advocate for the community? Um, and how do we advocate for the community? Because oftentimes um, there can be difference, uh, differences in opinion in community associations or neighborhood associations. And so how can we unify um, and represent a whole community, a whole association 
without any one individual feeling left out, without them feeling like the, the democratic process was not for them. And so we always encourage um, as an advocacy organization that on behalf of the community, we stand by you, we support um, the rezoning request if that's something that they want to see in their neighborhood. Um, if, it's, if it aligns with our organization, then we will also support that. Um, another example is our settlement communities um, example in which a lot of the challenges in settlement community um, applications are defining boundaries. Um, and so even as an organization, some of the educational resources that we have are um, people who, who do know how to uh, search for these plots that can be so uh, severely un undocumented, but also just hidden in the realm of the historical archives. Um, and so as an advocacy organization, our job really is to um, to share with community members how we can support them, but also not be presumptuous in assuming that they need our help. Right, great. Well, well, thank you, Kelly and and Robbie. I'll I'll turn it over to you and and um you know maybe ask for your experience, and then maybe we'll have a um a short conversation here about what we've been talking about. So, Robbie, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, Robbie Maynard, I'm a project manager with the Coastal Conservation League uh, in our communities and transportation uh, program. So, so y'all met Rachel a little bit earlier that works directly on shoreline issues with our land, water, and wildlife program. Our team focuses a little bit more, well, substantially a lot more on what's happening uh, on the land side, even though we know that that's going to impact not just um, our communities, but also our natural resources. So we look a lot at land use policy and planning um, and land conservation, but we work on a hyper local level. Um, so, so for me, I'm a primarily focused on Berkeley County and on Dorchester County uh, because we know that to, to have, to be able to engage um, with those local governments, you, it's really about relationships, both with the governments themselves and with the communities that are there. So uh, I work specifically with, with rural communities um, most of the time. And, and that can often be a little bit more difficult of, a, of communities to, to access. And you know, similar to what Kelly has talked about with, with trying to explain the, this sort of middle ground that we occupy as, as advocates. Um, so what we try to focus on through that program is, is working alongside these communities, not identifying issues, taking that to the community and telling them, you know, that how or why that would impact them, but really being present uh, in communities, around communities, at local government meetings to be able to, to come alongside communities. And so that's how I have, have met um, various communities um, throughout Berkeley and Dorchester is by being at local government meetings and, and when folks are, are having questions about certain things that are going on, a lot of times that is rezonings in, in my line of work um, that is going to impact um, the, the, the surrounding community. Um, and so, multiple times that's where just being present and being a part of, of that democratic process you, you get to meet folks that are that are facing some of these issues and what I see is my role is breaking down some of the the barriers that exist in uh, citizen participation right because zoning is a pretty complex uh, set of, of rules and, and ordinances and, and it's a it's a wacky process to get something rezoned of going through planning commission and then the planning committee and then county council. And so what we try to do is empower communities to be able to participate in that process by first kind of shining some light on the process itself and how that works, but also helping them to, to kind of contextualize what it is that they're worried about. So if a small settlement community like, like Kelly has mentioned is worried about a massive rezoning around their community, um, maybe from what has previously been agriculture to industrial uses, they know that they don't want that and they know that they're highly concerned and they know that, that that's not, shouldn't be allowed. 
what we can do is help provide some of the, the data and the, the factual uh, basis of, of how to approach that argument, not just in like a livability and, and lived experience um, perspective, which is, is, is certainly important and maybe the most important aspect of that, but we can kind of help um, shine some light on the, the rules and regulations and how those concerns that they have with their homes and their communities fit into things like comprehensive plans and zoning codes. So that's really how I see my role. Great, thank you. And I, you know, deliberative governance really is this this equation of bringing you know the best data and information and knowledge, you know, to a a, a body, um, a community who are making a decision, and then um, having you know allowing them to use that information or that data or that science to make the best decision they can for themselves, both both factually. And ethically, and you know, one of the things that I I think that um, I, I'd like to look at both sides of the equation, and um, on, on the input side, I guess I would call it, um, you know, we we look at, and I think it does, um, you know, people who are experts uh, like uh, you know Steve Durkee and others who we heard earlier this morning on fisheries or scientists on hydrology and things like that. That's all really essential information to have. But one of the other sources of information that is also important that sometimes gets overlooked is local knowledge or indigenous knowledge. And I just I'd like to ask whether you know uh, what your uh, uh, experience or impressions have been in making sure that that local knowledge or, or indigenous uh, experience, you know, gets included as part of the deliberative process. And Kelly, I'll ask you to go first and then Robbie. Sure, so um, with this recent meeting of the West Side Neighborhood Association, there was a, a rezoning request for um, a certain amount of, of levels and floors and stories. And um, this, the neighbors who have lived there the longest are very familiar with the floodplains. And so they understand and have seen the gradual increase of the rise in water. They have seen from their childhood, their parents' childhood, they know um, the streets that flood. They know um, the obstacles or what, where to avoid and why to avoid it at certain times. Um, and so for them to, to teach us you know, we've been seeing this for 10 years. We've been seeing this for 15 years. Um, one, it's informative for us to also create a narrative that is both supportive of the community, but also to encourage them that that's something that needs to be shared at a public meeting. Um, their livability speaks greater volumes than our presence as an advocacy. Um, and so really encouraging them that they do have the knowledge and empowering those community members that they do have the knowledge. Um, they just are asking for our support. Right, great. Robbie, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, this is a, a great question. And I, I think this is some of my favorite elements of, of the work that we've been able to do especially working in, in rural areas and areas that maybe have not benefited from the same kind of, of historical record keeping and, and recognition that, that Kelly's group and, and others do, do so well um, on the peninsula and around Charleston. Because I think that, you know, one thing that, that I, it's, it's kind of like a, a quirky, um, that is, is when, when working up in, in some of the, the um, rural areas, getting to know the names of, of swamps and of, uh, of tributaries that um, often have multiple names and multiple connotations depending on who you ask and, and um, what those folks are. So that's one that I think, it seems like a small thing, but I, I think that, that it kind of shows the, the connection that local and rural communities have to the landscape um, even if they're they're maybe not owning that aspect that that land, um, because that is one thing I think when and Andy I'm sure you have more experience with this than anyone of in, in land use you know 
issues, discussions, there's there's such a such an emphasis on property rights and that the owner has the ultimate um, you know, decision over what it is that they can do. But when you're talking about a community that's, you know, surrounded by by other um, by land that's owned by others, they still have a connection to that landscape and to the the way of life um, that that landscape provides for them. So that, to me, getting to learn those those local um, names for things, the, the way that folks interact with the, the landscape, um, it, it really is is what what I think inspires me to to keep working on these things. Yeah, you know, the, what, what's so striking about both of those is, you know, Kelly mentions, you know, stories and history and, and oral history. And then, Robbie, you, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, naming, you know, what, what are the names of things? And those are really, I think, so important because it's the it, it really is the um, the context isn't it, of, of all of these decisions and the lived experience of people in these communities that, you know, is a vital um, uh, part of the decisions that they're going to be making going forward. Well, I, I want to look at the other side now of the equation at the deliberative process itself. And one of the questions that I, I think is so important there is um, who is convened, who's there, and who's making the decision? And so as, as advocates and facilitators and conveners, um, how do you make sure that the right people are in the room and that all of the interests involved in the decision-making are represented? So uh, Robbie, I'll let you go first this time. Thank you, yeah. And this, this I think is, is probably the most difficult aspect of, of the job. Um, because typically these, you know, thinking again, we'll stick with, with land use decisions are made um, by elected officials, uh, county council um, representatives uh, in a government meeting that sometimes um, happens at, at five o'clock or, or could also, you know, um, comes with a, a four hour time frame and a long agenda. Uh, and so getting, getting folks to that table, I think is, is often difficult because they're just sort of uh, you know, predictable barriers of, of when are these meetings? How do you get there? How do you participate? How do you sign up to speak if you want to speak at a, a public hearing or, or give comments at the beginning of a uh, um, council meeting? And so what what we often try to do is, is serve as that middle ground, meet with communities um, at places where it's convenient for them, um, at times that is convenient for them, and do our best to try and facilitate uh, and really to advocate, I feel that that a lot of what I'm, when I actually get up and, and at council meetings to advocate for, it's for involving the public more in the process. It's not um, necessarily giving a, a stance or an opinion, but, but advocating for it, has the community been notified about this? How have they been notified? What kind, types of meetings have you had? And so really, I think that's, that's my role. And uh, it's sort of I, my background is in English, um, and I'm working for an environmental nonprofit, uh, which often raises a few eyebrows. But but to me, my role is to take you know I'm good at reading and good at synthesizing information, and so taking the information that we have, synthesizing that, and and spreading it to you know the the stakeholders and the folks that need to be involved uh, is my role, and I think I think that it's sort of well suited. Um, but even so, I think that we still have limitations to who we can reach. Um, Kelly, I think, touched on that. And, and we'll, of, of, you know, you have to be in communities, you have to be present, you have to be a part of it, and you have to, to have patience um, to, to really um, become a part of that because, you know, we can, I can, I can type up some notes from a council meeting and send it out to, you know, a typical listserv of our members with the Coastal Conservation League that may not reach anyone that, that knows that this community is being impacted. So it's really even more of a grassroots and traditional approach to where is this, what's nearby, who can we connect to there? Great. Yeah. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, Kelly, what's your experience been? Sure. So my experience has definitely been uh, similar to Robbie's and uh, we can't guarantee that everybody um, can be represented, but we can guarantee that we're going to give a hundred percent effort. And so when attending my job as a community outreach coordinator is to be out in the public, to 
go to community, not just community meetings, but also just community events um, and to really be intentional in building relationships. And so as you're building relationships, you get to understand a little more of the dynamic in the community. You get to understand and see firsthand uh, people's livability, their schedules, their livelihood. Um, you start understanding them as your neighbor. And so in, in order for us to make our best efforts, we always ask, who do we need to talk to? Who wasn't here that we need to ask? Everybody in the community knows one another. Um, we're kind of the new friends uh, that are being invited to the cookout, per se. Um, and so in doing that, we're also enabling and building trust in the community and enabling them to, uh, to talk to one another of, have you reached out to Kelly? Have you talked to Robbie? Um, you know, these, these are good friends and we do um, love the way that they support us. We love that they can advocate for us when we cannot attend a public, a public meeting that's at five o'clock at night because we have children, because we have to work late, because the bus line doesn't run that late. And by the time the meeting is over, I won't have a way home. And so I think for us, it's also being able to be above reproach and then also being quick to listen and slow to speak, um, really sitting down in these community meetings and taking notes for ourselves to understand um, better where their decisions might be, what kinds of resources have they had to review in making the best um, decision led, um, I guess, thought. And then also how can how can we extend um, some notes that we can compare um, and really, really asking questions of, you know, do you fully understand what uh, the BAR permitting process means and what that entails? Um, and so a lot of that is also being patient um, and not just assuming that everybody understands and there's this grand okie doke that we, <laughs> that because, you know, because my trusted friend says that I, that they want this, that it's good for the neighborhood, um, that we're then going to support it. But we also want to make sure that everybody's educated. And so um, in order to also capture the other narrative, uh, narrative of that is to ask questions of, okay, do you, do you understand, you know, not, not do you understand, but what other questions uh, should we be considering as a neighborhood, as we look to the future? Um, is this something that you want to pass down to the next generation? Great. Well, I want to thank you both. I see we're already out of time, which is, uh, I, I knew that it was going to be a, a short, a too short conversation, but I want to thank you both for being here and for, and for what you do every day uh, to help engage our, our communities and our, our, our local people in being able better to govern themselves. And so I want to thank you for that. I also want to encourage the folks who are watching um, either now or who will be watching um, this on um, video to, um, in, uh, if you, you know, your audience is all around the world, but, you know, local um, uh, decision-making like this really is not that dissimilar wherever you are. And so I, I know that both Robbie and Kelly would welcome your questions and welcome your engagement. And so they, they can both be reached at the, uh, at their uh, two organizations. And so I encourage you to reach out to them and engage them in, in questions and in a conversation. So uh, with that, I wanna thank you both and Gray, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Well, thank you all, all of you for uh, such an amazing panel. Um, I, am, I am so excited to continue this conversation. Uh, with you and with our audience in the future. Um, echoing that, if you have any questions about any of the panels today, feel free to submit them uh, either at uh, the Sustainable Ocean Alliance Charleston's website or to the email that came uh, with your invitation. Uh, we'd be happy to, to help uh, connect you with the individuals who are on the panel today to try to get your questions answered. So here we are, we're, we're wrapping up today. Um, this has been a pretty brief time together, um, but um, I, I wanna thank everyone who was here today, all of our panelists and speakers who participated 
in the First Hope Conference. You bring an incredible wealth of knowledge and experience to this conversation to help realize both the multidisciplinary and the intersectional nature of the challenges that we face, but also the importance of multidisciplinary coalitions to craft intersectional solutions. Kelly Thorvalson showed us how interconnected we are all through this vast web of life that surrounds us and the global systems that make life on this planet possible. We also saw how community action to take care of those systems can have widespread impacts in solving these, these regional and beyond challenges. Rachel taught us about how communities can actively rebuild and manage natural systems to restore biodiversity and mitigate harmful flooding while generating uh, economic opportunities and embracing the power of the natural world to create viable solutions for their communities. Steve helped us to better understand the state of our fisheries here in coastal South Carolina and in the South Atlantic states of the United States so that we can be more educated and sustainable in choosing when it come, uh, when, which seafood we're going to uh, try to fish for, order at stores, or how we can be better participants in uh, the entire industry and culture surrounding seafood. Grace opened our eyes to the power of education and how it's capable of building deep cultures of caring and how that caring can transform entire communities and create agency and equity, thus hope. And Andy, Kelly, and Robbie just taught us about how we as citizens can effectively collaborate with governing institutions to promote sustainable and equitable futures. We intend this to be the beginning of the conversation. In fact, it should be the beginning of many, many conversations. We're living in a shifting world where entire societies and, uh, and systems of life, food, commerce, law, education, and power are shifting around us. Each of us has a responsibility to ensure that these new systems are just, equitable, and reflective of the diversity of our communities and the diversity of those communities' needs. At the beginning of our time together this morning, I asked whether this would be a story of senseless destruction or a story of awakening and redemption. By being here with us today, each of you is choosing hope. Each of you who watches this video in the future is choosing hope. As we said at the beginning of this conference, hope is a powerful thing. It can make the impossible possible and can unite disconnected people in pursuit of something grander than themselves. We spoke a lot about human communities today and the ways in which we can create resilient and regenerative future for our descendants. This is only part of the path forward. We also must be good citizens of the wider living communities that we inhabit. Biologists define communities as interwoven and interacting systems of living things in a shared location. These systems represent the infinite interplay of all living and inanimate forces in the universe as a colossal network of networks, infinitely stretching outward through time and space from the beginning of our universe to its inevitable end. Imagine a tapestry made up of millions upon millions of tiny threads. Each thread, of this tapestry is a species or a subspecies fulfilling its niche within the surrounding natural system. The greater the biodiversity, the more resilient that ecosystem will be to change. The more species that disappear from an ecosystem, the greater the risk the entire tapestry unravels. The key to our future rests in humanity reconciling our fragmented relationship with life on this planet and embracing our place within the tattered tapestry to make it whole again. To forge a resilient future for humanity on our planet, we must restore our fragmented link to the world around us. In order to heal our planet, and in doing so heal ourselves, we must stop seeing ourselves as something apart from the rest of the world and return to seeing ourselves as part of the natural world. The central figures in my films are ordinary people doing extraordinary things as they embrace their roles as stewards and builders. They're coral gardeners, kelp foresters, giant clam nurserymen, mangrove cultivators, and educators restoring the link between their communities and these special places. 
Some of the inheritors, uh, or some of them are inheritors of indigenous wisdom and traditions that blend deep historical memory with observational scientific data to yield intimate connections to the biomes they hope to save. Some are innovators establishing highly efficient carbon sinks and living flood control measures for their communities by hacking the natural benefits of seagrasses, longleaf pine trees, oysters, and kelp. One thing that unifies these visionaries is they know a coral reef is more than just the corals. They see the vibrant diversity of life that is essential to the reef's survival. They see the cleaners, waste collectors, street vendors, construction workers, house sitters, and even doormen that keep these bustling underwater metropolises humming. They travel the local roads and high-speed expressways linking these reefs to the other bustling hubs of life along coastlines and up watersheds on one side and out into the deep sea on the other. Some lives begin in the reef, others in the mangrove or seagrass savannas, but they all intersect at some point to play a vital role in the highly complex and interlinked web that supports the whole. The stewards know this. They've seen erosion from deforestation smother the reefs in a blanket of silt. They've seen the insatiable hunger of people from far away snatch more than 90% of all big fish from our oceans. When these biomes become damaged by human or natural forces, the stewards must become the keystone species that fill the void of these greatly diminished ecosystem e engineers by rebuilding the indispensable biomes until the reef can recover. This work requires more than just a handful of dedicated visionaries. It requires a community. So the stewards must become educators. This, uh, this education must be immersive and tangible. In, in part of the Pacific, the team behind Chasing Coral, uh, Coral used uh, Google Cardboard and other simple 360 degree technology to reveal reefs uh, that were otherwise unseen up close by the fishing communities that had lived there and worked there for generations. Their children immediately fell in love with the magical world beneath the waves. And so too did the fishermen who became stakeholders in a new sustainable management pact meant to protect the reefs and nurseries from exploitation. On the other side of the world, classrooms of children gazed in awe of the radiant beauty of these far off cities beneath the waves. They dreamed of a world filled with wonder and demanded ways to ensure their dream of a vibrant and thriving world does not become the nightmare of runaway climate change and mass extinction. To overcome the impacts of climate change, restore global biodiversity and create regenerative futures around the world, we need community-driven solutions guided by local knowledge and led by local people. We look to the natural world as an ally and guide as we explore systems-based tools for restoring and regenerating the very natural systems that sustain our existence. The beauty of systems-based thinking is that it often yields far more questions than answers. It requires patience and a keen perception of the intangible. Climate change once felt gargantuan and beyond the power of an individual to influence, but as the effects of climate change become more personal and tangible, the systems that naturally combat climate change become more clear. They become more clear as the pathway to a resilient future that involves natural climate solutions. Decarbonization is only half the fight for a regenerative planet. When we equip our children with the superpower of curiosity, we grant them the tools to be the change they need in this world. We give them reasons to hope and fueled by this hope, they have the agency to do things we could never imagine. Across the world, citizen scientists embrace the responsibility of observing and tracking the changes they see in forests, reefs, and shorelines whether they're children exploring their passions or concerned stakeholders fighting to save their livelihoods and homes, 
they are part of a global community searching for solutions to the challenges that threaten our very existence. They are the grassroots network that could be our deliverance. Our battle is not in preventing climate change from happening. It's already here and it's already actively altering our world. Instead, we are fighting to prevent the worst impacts of climate change while mitigating the impacts we currently are experiencing. Our children and their children will live in a world that looks very different from the world we currently inhabit, but that doesn't have to be an apocalyptic statement. In fact, that can be a vision of hope by dramatically reducing the amount of greenhouse gases we're emitting and stopping the flow of harmful excess nutrients into our rivers and seas, we can give ourselves and the natural world a chance to find balance and begin the process of regeneration. The natural systems of our world are remarkably resilient. When given the chance, regeneration can be rapid and transformative. The key is giving nature a chance. That's our job, our niche as part of this ecological web. We have firmly inserted ourselves as a keystone species into nearly every ecological web on this planet. So we must embrace that role as gardeners to restore the tattered tapestry of life on our planet. Much of the knowledge needed for this already exists through traditional wisdom of indigenous people and of uh, long-term settle settlement in certain communities and through the evolutionary behavior of other species. What we need is a sea change of thought and a system shift of behavior where we as local communities work to restore and protect the biodiversity of the natural systems around us. Today, we at Sustainable Ocean Alliance Charleston are both proud and excited to announce our intent to create at least two Mission Blue Hope Spots in coastal South Carolina. Hope Spots are special places nominated on the grounds of having cultural and ecological significance that is unique to our world. I'm sure each of you could name a few places that you would nominate uh, along your coastline or surrounding the island community where you live. Once formed, these will be aspirational hubs of innovation, restoring the relationships between local people and the lands and waters that sustain them while creating new opportunities for sustainable and regenerative industries. While hope spots don't initially come with legal protection, they often become catalysts for collaboration between local communities, governments, and NGOs. They are aspirational places formed with the hope that future generations will be able to experience and benefit from the healthy and restored ecosystems of that hope spot. So please join us in the creation of these hope spots or in using these places as symbols for stewardship and for our love of the human and natural communities of our region. To ensure that future generations can share our love for communities, embrace your role as a steward to heal this beautiful garden that we all call home. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today.